Ladies and gentlemen, friends of democracy, defenders of human rights, it's a great pleasure for me to address the Oslo Freedom Forum. Even though this is a sad day, with uh, another possible terrorist attack in Britain, with a large amount of young casualties, I think it's, um, it's also, in light of that, it's extremely important that we are discussing which forces lead to extremism, and which forces can stop the extremism from, from expanding in our society. And I'm, I believe there is a connection between extremism and human rights. I think it's the lackage of human rights that, it, uh, that uh, fuels also extremism. So I think it's a very important work that you are doing. And I'm pleased to see such an impressive gathering of representatives from civil society, the media, Academy, uh, ac academia and um, governments and private sector. Among us are also people who are living under, who have lived or are still living under daily pressure and threats. So I would like to thank you for coming to Oslo and to give from your experiences, to tell your stories. And um, May is the month of uh, democracy and freedom in Norway. On the 8th of May, we mark our liberation after the Second World War. On the 17th of May, we celebrate our constitution, one of the absolute longest living European constitutions, which have the principle of democracy inside it. This document was paving the way for our independence. It also laid the foundation of democracy of Norway as a society that embraces values of democracy, openness, equal rights, and welfare for all. Even though I have to admit that in 1814, when this constitution was written, democracy was uh, not for everybody, especially not for women. Even though we were the second country that got, gave women the right to vote in 1913, it did take uh, 100 years until we enlarged democracy to all of us. But it's fitting that every May, Oslo Freedom Forum participated and filled the city with the spirit of courage, freedom, and hope. And I believe that democracy and respect of human rights are crucial for securing peace and stability, both within and between states. Good governance, the rule of law, are vital for development, for economic growth, for innovation. Still, democracy is complicated, time-consuming, and at times very frustrating, not the least for us as politicians. But it is our best tool for making the most out of the human capital in every country. And I think all of us here in this room can agree that holding elections and passing laws does not in itself constitute democracy. A, a vibrant and robust democracy is a mosaic. It's a balance between strong institutions, its independent judiciary, and elected government, its parliamentary, parliamentarians with interests of the people at heart. And there can be no democracy without a, div a diverse civil society, freedom of assembly, and a free press. Furthermore, individual freedoms are the bedrock of any true democracy. Democratic society is one in which every individual can enjoy freedom and equal opportunities to shape the direction of their own life. And as I said earlier on, I do believe that this is the best vaccine we have against extremism, against those who want to tear down our society and the liberal freedoms. In many parts of our world, human rights defenders uh, face great danger. It's unacceptable. And standing up for human rights in the face of danger and repression requires tremendous courage. And you have to be brave when you document the atrocity committed in the war zones of Syria, South Sudan, or Yemen. Or to raise your voice for gender equality in Saudi Arabia, or to go out on the streets in Venezuela to defend democratic rights and the constitutional order. 
You also have to be brave to criticize the way security challenges and freedom of expressions are being handled in Turkey these days. And several of you in this room must have courage like this every day. And I believe we should all applaud your work. I am concerned that governments whose responsibility is to protect and implement human rights are pursuing policies that actually can do the opposite. Freedom of expression, the right to peaceful protest, must be respected and protected. And civil society play an important role in holding governments to account. I sometimes say, because in Norway, all large organizations are part of our Bay budget, I usually say that I keep a well living for all my critics. That's also one of the things you have to do in a Norwegian society. As authorities, we should be grateful for the work that you are doing as defenders of human rights. The protection of human rights defenders is a key priority in Norwegian foreign policy. Under our leadership, the UN has adopted far-reaching resolutions on human rights defenders. And this would not have been possible without close cooperation with the civil society. Now we must all act to implement these resolutions as at the national level. Ladies and gentlemen, in this world today, we are facing a growing implementation gap between the internationally agreed norms and the realities on the ground. We see that the human rights and established institutions are coming under pressure. Freedom of press and the independence of the judiciary are being undermined in a number of countries. And we cannot allow journalists, bloggers or media workers to be attacked, killed, imprisoned or labeled as terrorists simply for doing their job. And they do that in countries that have agreed to these international norms, who are passing through resolutions in the UN, but not implementing them in their own societies. And I'm deeply worried about a political discourse that can ignore the important role of the media in society, and instead undermines the media by fueling hate speech and spreading fake news. And we should all be troubled when politicians invoke the will of the people in order to put themselves above democratic institutions and or the constitutional principles. This is a dangerous form of populism. It undermines the democratic checks and balances and weakens the very fabric of society. And these trends need to be reversed. We must defend and strengthen our international human rights institutions. And we must safeguard the international agreed principles in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Two years ago, my government uh, launched the first white paper on human rights in 15 years. It put human rights at the center of Norwegian foreign and development policy. Ensuring respect for human rights is now an explicit foreign policy goal in itself. It's also a vital tool for achieving sustainable development, peace and security. And I would like to say that um, as a prime minister, I have some wonderful meetings. I have been privileged to meet several extremely courageous human rights defenders. Some of them are well known, widely respected. Others are lone voices defending vulnerable minorities. Last year in New York, I was particularly moved by Caleb Orozco, who was to challenge the law on same-sex activity in Belize, and won the case in the Supreme Court. This uh, led to the decriminalization of the same-sex uh, activity in the country and set a historic precedent in the Caribbean. He shared his personal journey as the face of the LGBTI movement in his country. For years, he had found the courage every day to face, uh, to face violence, threats, isolation, 
because of his outspoken activism. And it's a meeting like people like Caleb Orozco that gives me hope. And in the same way, I'm impressed by the Oslo Freedom Forum, who develops networks between defenders, technology companies, and entrepreneurs. And it's my hope that these networks will grow even stronger, creating even greater space for individual freedom around the globe. And I hope that in this in time, will reduce the burden on all of you who have the courage to speak out against oppression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the Prime Minister agreed to take a couple of questions, and uh, I think one of the important questions, given how many people are represented here uh, from certain countries, Norway is one of the most democratic, and recently, for those of you who may not know, on the index of happiness, it is at the very top of the index of happiness. Uh, we just beat the Danes. They have been in front for four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, Norway has this extraordinary uh, natural resource that it has exploited mm -hmm. to uh, the benefit of its population. Of the 10 largest oil producers in the world, only two of them, Norway and Canada, are democracies. The rest of them are authoritarian and dictatorial governments, which is what has led to the phrase, the resource curse. Mm. But in Norway and Canada, it's a resource blessing. Why would you say that's the case? Well, I, I think it's, it's basically based on historic reasons. I mean, if you find oil in a already industrialized country with strong democratic institutions, it's easier to handle this big influx of money that you will get and uh, then when you do it in a country that is very fragile uh, and that has not built democratic institutions before. But I think it's possible also to, to control it. That's why we have this program that's called Oil for Development, where we are trying to learn other governments how we both manage to not be the uh, sort of victims of multinational countries owning the resources ourselves, making control of it, getting the money into our activities and to our budget. The second thing is, uh, of course, how you do transparency in the whole process of, doing, uh, of having an uh, oil income, because it's the lack of transparency and it's the culture of corruption which be becomes even larger when you get that large flood of, of natural resources and income from that. So if you don't, uh, so you have to build transparency, you have to build rules of, uh, of how you deal with things. And um, we have, of course, managed to keep quite a lot of those money in a sovereign fund. We have managed to not use too much to, to ruin our economy uh, and to still have uh, an, uh, uh, a larger economy outside the oil, oil, oil sector. But I also think that this, uh, uh, to work very ex extremely against the culture of corruption mm -hmm. and have transparency in all decision making, being a predictable country is extremely important in this. And then I usually meet a lot of business as an advocate for the SDGs, business around the world, and I say that you can always blame countries for, for uh, you know, being unpredictable. But, you know, if business doesn't play along in the unpredictable part, then there won't be that much unpredictability. There is two sides to, for example, corruption. And, and if, if businesses are transparent on everything they do in countries, they can also help. So we can push this from the angle of business, too. Well, I, I'd say that uh, it's likely uh, a lot of people would agree that the reason why Norway is successful mm -hmm. and this transparent is because it is one of the countries that has, has multiple female leaders as head of state. And <laughs> there are, you know, uh, there are representatives here uh, who are in our community mm -hmm. that are females that have been political prisoners, who have been attacked and yet have led movements in countries where women's rights were almost uh, in, uh, non-existent, like Saudi Arabia or Pakistan mm -hmm. or Uganda. Um, and yet there are 197 countries in the world of which only 15 have female heads of state, and eight of those are the first female heads of state in those countries. What message do you have uh, with regard to this statement about Norway's success having to do with female heads of state, and what message do you have for those in our community that are mm. in that struggle? 
Well, the first, I, I, I don't believe that everything good in Norway is due to the fact that we have women in politics and a lot of them. I think, but I think it's important that women are participating in politics because I think it gives a different set of priorities, especially in the beginning of more women into politics. They came with a different agenda. They came with the agenda of saying that uh, we need kindergartens for our children if we are all going to work. They came with the agenda that the welfare system of our society also have to take care of elderly people because if women are working, we need to have other, other networks of, of doing this. So that it, it has transformed also policy making because there are more women and there are more women in all, all, all of the political life. And I think that's, of course, in any democracy, Representation by all means also by all women. I think it's all totally natural. And it will change the political agenda in a country if you do that. Secondly, I think it's a waste of talent and resources. Uh, when uh, when uh, half of your population is not participating in politics, or half of your population is not working, that's, uh, that's the lackage of talent. It, I mean, there's a large possibility for that big new entrepreneur as a woman, as a man in most countries, maybe they will find totally new things to do. I mean, your, the country becomes poorer when women don't get the same opportunities as men. And the second, and, and the, for me, the most important thing is to make sure that girls get education. That's why that's a priority for my government. It's been... <laughs> and not just enrolled in first grade, but finishing second grade. And that the quality of that education is so good that you can, in fact, continue further. I mean, it's when you get that balance in a society, that women are as well educated as men, I think the rest goes much more natural afterwards. But I think you, you need to get educated, you need to make sure that access to, to education is there, and then you will build the civil force of women in the society, because if you are educated, you also know that somebody is taking away your opportunities. Well, men are not going to give women their rights in some of these countries. Women are going to have to take them. Mm -hmm. Do you have a message for the women here from, from these countries who are struggling? Just to keep on working. I mean, the world will change. And, uh, and, and I, I am sure that, uh, that you will see women in decision-making processes in a lot of other countries in the years to come. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a question of working together. It's a question of uh, getting women's network to function together. And it's also to tell that one line, you are losing out of talent if you're not using all of your citizens in a country. Well, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you so much for coming.